It's wonderful to be back in Prague after 20 years. So mm -hmm. the city has changed. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, sur the Survivor Tree video that I presented here at the show, at the Prague um, Biennale uh, uh, Reconnect Art. And uh, I, I kind of want us to think about, do we have agency with our use of technology? That's, that's kind of the underlying theme here. So um, this talk will be about a brief discussion about the reasons uh, uh, for the why and how the US uh, uh, bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki and how messed up that was. Um, about the survivors, and finally, just a brief discussion of uh, uh, my notion of utopia and how maybe Prague is a bit of a utopia. Um, so, so why did the USA drop the bomb? Um, we are taught in the US that it was, uh, or the myth, the mythos of it is we, the US dropped the bomb on Hiroshima because uh, we were going to invade, and it, would, it would, would have saved hundreds of thousands of, of American soldiers' lives. This was not the case. Um, there was no, the plans to invade Hiroshima after the disaster of Okinawa, where 50,000 American troops died and several hundred thousand Japanese died, um, the, the plan was actually to blockade Japan, wait for Russia to join, and slowly blockade uh, uh, Japan until it surrendered. Um, in the meantime, though, uh, the Manhattan Project had been happening, and um, we had these bombs. And so the question was what to do with them. Um, the, the, that mythos, the, the one aspect of that mythos that's important to remember is that it served both the US and Japan in that it presented, oh, well, we dropped the bomb, and that's terrible. The US dropped the bomb, and that's terrible. But it was to save hundreds of thousands of lives. In the end, more lives were saved in the mythos than, than were lost um, um, facing these cities. Um, and it served the Japanese as well, because it turned them from the aggressor in World War II into the victim. Um, so so there, there are several reasons um, why the bomb ended up being dropped that make it present a more muddied kind of a picture. The first reason was, and this is what I think connects to AI and things that we're seeing today, like the previous movie, um, uh, is that um, we had created this new device and the scientists wanted to see what it was going to do. Um, and that's this, this, this sort of this, this deterministic notion, well, we have this technology, what is it going to do? Um, and so the scientists, the, the military industrial complex, which is very powerful in the U.S. today, even more, so, even more powerful today than it was back then, wanted to see what was going to happen with the bomb. Um, and so, so the proof of that is that there were two bombs, and each one had a different design, and after the, uh, after the, the bombs were dropped, American scientists, and, and, and Japan surrendered, American scientists descended upon Japan and really studied what had happened. Um, the, the generals and admirals were against it, uh, uh, which is kind of weird to think about the warmongering, well, not warmongering, but, you know, MacArthur, uh, uh, later on wanted to drop the bomb on Korea. In this case, he said, no, we shouldn't do it. And the admirals as well were against it. So, um, they were overruled. Um, one of the main reasons I think the bomb ended up getting dropped was that Roosevelt had passed away just six months before, and the new President Truman, who was kind of a country bumpkin from Missouri, wanted to project, project strength. And I think an important aspect of this was it wasn't as much, uh, uh, I think everyone by this time, by the summer of 1945, knew that America was going to win the war eventually. Um, but the real reason to pro project the strength was to push back against the Russians and Stalin. Um, and to, it was sort of like this mano a mano thing very similar to the, to the film we were just were watching, in a way, um, that's extra, just sort of 
just so childish, really. But that seems to be that seems to be diplomacy, unfortunately. So um, uh, uh, the the um, Truman's uh, Secretary of State, this guy Burns, who was a Southern gentleman, really pushed to drop the bomb. Um, and in the end, the Japanese didn't surrender because of the bombs being dropped. In fact, the proximate reason why the Japanese surrendered is because the Russians entered the war. Um, and the Japanese were afraid that if the Russians invaded the mainland of Japan, they would lose their emperor. So very quickly, they surrendered um, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the larger point here is it was unnecessary to drop the bombs. Um, it was sort of... It just was a terrible thing, and other things could have been done, like a demonstration bomb could have been dropped in Tokyo Harbor. There were other things that could have been done that would have shown the horror of dropping the bomb, yet still the bomb was dropped. Um, so the Japanese generals did not recognize the implications of the atom bomb. Indeed, the recent firebombing of Tokyo had killed more people. The dropping of the atomic bomb precipitated Russia's entry into the war. So because we dropped the bomb, Russia entered the war earlier, and that's actually why the Japanese surrendered. Um, so so it's, a, it's a bit of a more complicated picture than, than what is presented. Um, so, so what are the implications of this? Um, returning to the old Prague story of the Gollum um, or Frankenstein, once a technology is developed, it tends to get used. So this is what's facing us today with artificial intelligence. We have this new technology. Uh, are we gonna, what are we gonna do with it? Or can we put it back into Pandora's box? That's the question. Do we have agency? Um, today, there are so many ways for our civilization. I mean, and I think, um, the film that we just watched really captured the kind of zeitgeist of the moment, just this kind of horror um, that I think everybody's feeling post-corona and there's climate change and there's all these kind of horrific things happening. Do we have agency as a society to take a different course? You know, um, And I would argue that we do, but I'm an optimist. Um, um, and that's, that's really difficult. Um, so, so, so rather than complain about it, I have, I have two possible things to, to, to consider. One is regulation. Um, we, need, we need to control, in this case with nuclear weapons, we need to stop proliferation. We need to restart the, the peace treaties. That seems very far away right now with the war in Ukraine. And just, you know, it's not like anyone's really talking about it. Um, an interesting aspect of what's happening today with China rapidly building up their nuclear weapons. When you have two forces opposing each other, they, like you know the Soviet Union and the United States, now Russia and the United States, they kind of they can balance each other, right? But you have three things, and you get what's called the three-body problem. I don't know if you know that from math. The three-body problem stuff gets really complicated really quickly. So it's really impenitent. It's really important for us as a global civilization to consider these things and, and do something about it. In my mind, the nuclear problem is the most obvious one, and I, I would hope the one that we could do something about, um, because there's so many other problems now that we need to face and deal with, whether it's you know the climate change or um, any other, any number of other things, such as AI. Um, another thing that we have to consider as a society is building up the resilience of our society. And I think that's what the trees, um, the trees help us to consider, and that's the resilience of these survivor trees. So, so can the semi-intelligent monkeys get a little bit smarter? And life is resilient whether or not the semi-intelligent monkeys are still going to be around. Um, so here, here is a photo from Hiroshima. This shows some of the trees. And this is what the trees were like after the bomb was dropped. There is the uh, Gambaku Dome designed by the Czech architect in the background. And uh, here's a still of a survivor tree. 
Um, here um, is a map showing the hypocenter. So in Hiroshima, it's a beautiful city of rivers, and the target for the bomb was this T bridge. So it's like a, the shape of a T. That's what they aim for, and the Gambaku Dome was right beneath that. And because the shock wave of the bomb went directly into the atrium of the Gambaku Dome, that building survived. But basically, out to about 700 meters, everything was effaced, um, and the blast blast took up about two kilometers of the city that was just raised completely. Um, so it was it was quite brutal. Um, some friends of mine, uh, the guys who did the Rostrum's Universal Robots, just visited Theresienstadt. I remember visiting Theresienstadt uh, when I was living here in Prague, and there were some Ju German students there, and they were twittering awkwardly, and, and obviously it was affecting them, and they were kind of giggling because they were students, and they felt terrible about the thing. For an American to go to Hiroshima, one must be confronted with the fact that you know, the concentration camps killed, mm, I think it's like about 100,000 people every couple of months, while we Americans did the same in an instant. And that's, that's deeply frightening, and it, it confronts particularly an American who tries to stay optimistic, you know, uh, uh, our country has done terrible things, and, and, and I think this is something we need to make up for um, on any number of levels, one of which is to help the world move beyond these nuclear bombs, these nuclear weapons. Um, right, so reminding me to watch the film. Let's go through and look at some trees really quickly. So here's the video. Um, I'll just kind of skip through it. Uh, and so this survivor tree is at this temple. Um, and the priest who is the head priest of this temple is still alive and... He told, we, I work with some students, and he told the story of that day um, when the bomb was dropped. So this is another thing to consider what's very, a little bit frightening right now. It's about, it's a little bit more than 75 years since the bomb was dropped. And the last survivors of the atomic bomb are now passing away, just like the last survivors of the concentration camps, the last, survi the last people who fought in World War II are now passing away. And we're losing this historical memory of this time. And it's really important we keep it alive. There he is um, talking about the bomb. So that's the ginkgo tree. That was a couple of kilometers away, but it's still mostly burnt down. And the survivor tree is built into the gate of that temple. Uh, here's a big tree. Um, this one's quite lovely. Um, just in the hills. And so the people kind of fled after the bomb dropped. The people fled to the hills. And the day after the bomb, many people sought shelter by this tree. So this tree has a lot of significance to the people of Hiroshima. Um, so all these trees have these, these intense stories. And, and it's, just, it's just amazing how they've grown back. What's interesting, you notice, I believe this is pointed towards the hypocenter. And so all of the trees, um, the side pointed towards where the bomb was, are, little, are damaged. And so all of the trees, as they've grown, they've grown at a slight angle towards the hypocenter. Of course, the trees all have genetic damage. Um, though they look healthy, they're not all that healthy. And the question is, their seeds, where will the trees go? Um, here's a beautiful uh, uh, black pine. Um, that's in the center of a temple, um, just a beautiful tree. Um, so the trees, the trees grow back. It's sort of like Chernobyl has turned into this wildlife park um, without the people living there. Um, here's one by a scientific research center. This is a little cherry tree. This is one of the trees that's not doing so well. Um, my dear friend uh, Kuniko Watanabe, she showed me this tree. This is, it's up uh, this staircase, and this building is shut down, and it's just this very quiet, beautiful sort of a place, uh, uh, this little cherry tree. And as we progress, we're kind of getting closer and closer to the center. Um, here's another one. Um, 
we interviewed a couple uh, who survived and they sought shelter by this tree, a, a pussy willow. Um, and this one's just beautiful with the light coming through. Um, so Hiroshima's grown up around um, the sites of the atomic bombing and it's quite a wealthy city. Mazda is based near there. I believe there's a cannon factory close to there. Um, so, so it's become quite a normal city, and I think a lot of the Japanese people want to move beyond um, the, the story of the atomic bombing, but, but it's so in, I think it's so important for the world that this site be remembered, and the, the kind of taboo against dropping the bomb is retained, because it, it's just a the bombs are terrible things, and we can't forget that. This tree has a very complicated story. It's interesting, there's a rope there. After the bomb was dropped, um, this, this pussy willow is in the samurai garden um, of the Hiroshima castle. And after the bomb was dropped, a couple days later, an American uh, bomber was dropped, and it was, it was you know, a few days before the, the, um, the surrender, and um, they, they tied up the pilot and beat him to death underneath this tree. So, so, so you know, they're, they're, the, the, the stories are complicated. The legacy is pretty heavy. Um, but it's something that we need to dig into. And I feel like in today's world with the Internet, with, with all this fake news everywhere, we, we've all, we all kind of feel like, is there truth out there? What is, the, what, is, what is reality? And I would suggest that we can find the truth, but it takes a long time, and it takes deep study, like, like the story of how the U.S. dropped the atomic bomb. It's much more complicated than the story that is presented. And we need to come at things in a deep um, and serious perspective and do our best to try and understand, because that's the only way we're going to transcend and avoid these many pitfalls that are in front of our global civilization. Um, so one of the one of the ways, another way that we can deal with things is is by having our society be resilient. And this is one thing I have to say. Coming to Prague after 20 years, is the resilience of this city is um, it pretty incredible? Like. Um, I guess you guys probably don't know a lot of my work, but I love riding the trams. I'm, I was hanging out at Halavni Nadraji all day today. And f coming from an Amer American cities now, which are really in a great deal of trouble, Prague seems to function really well. Like, seriously. I know Czech people are always like, oh, everything is terrible. Oh, no. Dave Perdella, you know. Um, but but in coming from an American context, Prague seems like a little bit of a utopia to me. It seems as though things are running really well. Like I was on the tram the other day, the tram where the doors wasn't shutting correctly, and immediately this little repair vehicle came out, and the guys came and they fixed the door, and the tram kept on running. And the trams come every five minutes. And, and from an American perspective anyways, from someone who hasn't been back for 20 years, Prague seems very wealthy. It seems pretty well off. This Hybernska campus, what a cool spot. It seems like things actually maybe are running a little bit better than those of you living here maybe can, can because you've been here, it all seems normal. But in fact, things are running pretty well in Prague. And so this idea of utopia, how can we, how can we imagine a better future, right? So, so the talk I just gave, the movie we first, wa we first watched tonight, very heavy, depressing stuff. How can we consider a better future for ourselves and our children? And I think it's coming together. I think it's a lot of the um, activities we've done here at Reconnect Prague. But it's also just in a larger sense, a community and a city that works, that is working well, um, has a tremendous amount of resilience. And I think we can have hope for the future. But the only way of having that hope is coming together, communicating with each other, and digging into these histories so we can do better in the future. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. All right. I would like to um, 
I would like to ask if maybe some of our visitors have a oh, questions. questions. <laughs> no worries. Well, you, you were saying that uh, Prague has changed a lot since the 20 years that you have yeah. been here last. So what actually changed? How, how do you see this change? Um, well, the mirrors, there aren't as many mirrors. Those lovely mir convex mirrors, there are fewer of those. Um, it's much more built up. Like, I haven't been to Namaste Republic until tonight, and I was like, oh, look at all these new things around. So that's kind of cool. There's definitely more hustle and bustle, I feel like. You know, everything's a bit more glossy. Um, there does seem to be a lot of wealth, which is very different than it was 20 years ago. I'm not sure if that's better, necessarily, you know. Um, but things are, a bit, uh, are definitely glossier. But the trams still seem the same. The trains are still running on time. Um, and the city is still very, very beautiful, you know. So in a way, it's been a continuity. Um, and it's just me, I've changed. Because I haven't been there for 20 years. I've raised my daughters, they're, you know, off to college. So it's really quite different. I guess I'm in a different place. But it still seems really fresh. And, 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 and the pragmatism of Czech people is something I'd forgotten about. Mm -hmm. Just making it work. Is really lovely. That's something I'd not, I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten about the Czech pragmatism, and I think that's something that the world, frankly, needs. So I wish Czech people would think about that and step up and you know step out with that pragmatic, those pragmatic notions and help the world. Well, that's amazing insight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Where I, I feel happy, and I think. Um, but uh, maybe you would like to say a couple words also about uh, other works, um, about uh, guerrilla actions, uh, painting, and uh, the digital technologies, how you interlace into your work. Well, huh? Well, oh, I don't have the, my, my website will take forever to start up. Just look at my website, peterbill.us. Um, when I was living here, I, was, I would take my a big canvas and go around town and paint plein air. And I guess it was about experiencing the city, just living in the city, experiencing the city. Uh, and Prague, I, I guess for me, Prague has always stood for this sense of sort of, yeah, this utopian city. It's such a lovely city that combines modern with old. Um, and that's wonderful. Most cities don't have that luxury. Like you think of Warsaw, it was, you know, destroyed in World War II. You think of a lot of other cities, of Prague has kept its history, and having that history present, I think, is just lovely. Um, but then there's the contemporary things happening here that are super cutting edge, that are awesome, you know? So, so it's just a wonderful combination of old and new. Well, thank you so much. All right. <laughs>